Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we're going to be looking at a Celestron CPC-1100, a big schmidt cassegrain Haven't played with one of those in a while. Now the CPC series is of course Celestron's Alt as mounted schmidt cassegrain series. If you're a Mead person, this is sort of Celestron's answer to the LX200. There are three models in this series, the 8, the 9 and a quarter, and the 11. I think that's probably correct because below the 8 inch, if you have a 6 inch schmidt cassegrain I think the Nextar handles it just fine. And the 14 inch, well, I think that's probably too big for one person to handle. Although in the past, in the 1980s and in that era, they did make C14s on fork mounts and some of those parts were made of cast iron. Now in most cases when I'm doing a telescope review, you'll see the telescope somewhere around me here. But this thing is really just too big to put over here. So let's get it up into the larger area and take a look at it. We're here with the CPC-1100 in pieces. This is what it's going to look like when you get it out into the field. Now here's the good news. It's only in two parts. There's the tripod and there's the optical tube. And in fact, this is just a larger version of the C6, which I have here. It's sort of a mini me version. Now what you have to do is take the telescope, write it so it's straight up, set it on the tripod, and then there are three little spring-loaded bolts here that you use to clamp it to where you need to go. Now, on the C6, it's not that big a deal. It only weighs a few pounds. You set it on there, there's the three thumb screws at the bottom, and you're good to go. The problem with this telescope is the tripod weighs 27 pounds. And by the way, the new versions I'm seeing are coming spec with a 19-pound tripod. Uh, that may have happened sometime between this version and the one that um, you're going to see if you get one. Uh, so I'm sure somebody will clarify me on the comments on this. But the new versions seem to be coming with a 19-pound tripod, which would, be, which would be substantially lighter. If you get the HD version, those I am all seeing having 27-pound tripods. So when you set this thing on, what you're supposed to do is center it on this little pin that's right, the, there's a hole at the bottom of the tripod of the base plate, and the entire structural integrity of this behemoth telescope rests on you being able to center that hole on this little pin on here. So I'm going to go ahead and do this. I'm going to do this in one take. So uh, th I screw up, you see it. Um, Experienced people tell me that they can do this fairly easily, but I am not experienced at this particular model. So let's go ahead and give this a try. Now this here is 65 pounds. It's not light. So let's go ahead and do this. <clears throat> There's only a handle on one side on the Celestron. That's, that's unusual. The, the Meads have handles on both sides. So the first step is to just get it, is to just get it up here. It doesn't matter how you get it up. Get it off your arms. Now some of you may be thinking, well, I can deadlift 65 pounds. It's not a big deal. But um, you can deadlift 65 pounds, but it's harder to do when it's set out like this. So you really need to get it, and then you need to center it, and my goodness, I did it. I did it first try. Um, yeah, it's usually not that easy, folks. I'm usually fishing around. So after you do this, you twist these things around. And I have found the hole. And in these three screws go. So after you do that, this is the clutch for the altitude. The clutch for the azimuth is here. And there you go, you have your telescope. All right, so when you do this, when you saw I had it up on the tripod but not centered on the pin, that's the worst part of this because what can sometimes happen is you think you have the optical tube centered on the pin, but you don't. There are some times when it feels like you have it on there, but it's not actually on there. And if you let go to go do something else, this could fall over. Now, I've had people tell me that it's pretty rare that this happens. You usually can tell as soon as you take your hand off this thing, you'll start to feel it rock. Uh, but if you're down here and this is 65 pounds, you know, it's, it's, it can be a scary situation. 
The person who owns this telescope tells me that he can do this within 10 or 15 seconds most of the time. So I guess you can eventually get used to this. Um, I got very lucky that time. I've never done it this fast. Uh, I've assembled it a few times out in the driveway. And keep in mind, when you do this, you're going to be doing this in the dark. <clears throat> so you're seeing the telescope in this JMI case. It's a rolling case and it really does help you move the telescope around. And you may be thinking, well, if I get this telescope, I really want to get one of these rolling cases. And I don't want to stop you from doing that. This thing was very, very convenient. Um, to get it up into this room, I had to roll this thing from the garage and it comes through two half flights of stairs. Uh, that was interesting and I'm actually kind of dreading taking it back down. But uh, it does have two wheels and a handle. It does, you know, help you do this. But there's two cautions I want to make before you run out and buy one of these things. First of all, the case weighs 35 pounds by itself. That's right, the, the case weighs as much as an entire Celestron ABX mount. So in other words, when you put the tube in there, tube is 65 pounds, the case is 35 pounds. When you put other accessories and things on here, which you're going to, you're talking well in excess of 100 pounds you're lugging around. Second thing I want to make uh, sure you understand is um, when you go to order one of these, uh, these are beautiful cases. JMI does great work on this. But I don't know what goes into the making of these things, but $775. So keep that in mind before you take the plunge. It is very convenient, um, but keep the weight and the cost um, in the back of your head. All right, so once you get this thing set up, I'll tell you, this thing is a lot of fun. 11 inches is getting into big scope territory. If you're looking in your star atlases, some of those little items that you're seeing start to become available to you. And in fact, much of the star atlas becomes available to you. And it's kind of fun to see, well, I wonder if I can find this. Like nobody else in the club has ever seen this particular galaxy or this particular cluster. It's kind of fun to work to poke around. Now the initialization process, there are so many features in this thing, I couldn't possibly go through them all. But in addition to the customary two star align, the planetary align and so forth, uh, it has a sky align system where all you do is wait for the internal GPS sensor to find time and place on the earth. Then you point the telescope at any three bright objects in the sky. These can even include the planets or the moon. Then you wait, it builds a model of the sky and off you go. You don't even have to know what the objects are. Pointing accuracy I found to be pretty good. I mean, 2,800 millimeters is hard to do. You have a really tiny field of view. I thought the pointing accuracy on this one is good. It's definitely a, a, a cut above the AVX and the mid-size mounts. So again, I found myself just looking at dim stuff just to see if I could find it. I tried to find Stefan's Quintet. Uh, I'm not sure if I caught them. I think I'm limited by my sky glow conditions here. I didn't have a problem finding NGC 7331. That's the little edge on galaxy that's near Stefan's. And as I pumped the power up, I thought if I maybe tap the tube a little bit that I could see maybe a couple of the brighter members of that cluster. Anytime you can see any of those, uh, that, that's pretty good. So downsides, okay, well, aside from the weight and the cost, you're gonna be kind of boxed into medium to high power, 2,800 millimeter focal length. You know, most of us have a 32 millimeter Plossel, for example, as a low power eyepiece in any normal size telescope, you know, an eight inch F6 Newtonian or an eight inch McCassegrain. Uh, it's a relatively low power eyepiece and you can see a lot. In this thing, it's 87 power. So you're gonna have trouble backing off sometimes to see the really big objects like, you know, the double cluster or the Pleiades or the entire Andromeda galaxy. Now you can put a focal reducer on here and put a big eyepiece on here. Uh, you can get it down to that 50 to 60 power range, but now you're kind of jumping through hoops and when you take the focal reducer out, it really shifts the uh, focus plane of this thing. But you can do it, but yeah, you, you kind of, you know, start uh, starts getting a little bit inconvenient. Under the right conditions, the planets look fantastic. Um, the optics on this one are really, really good. I couldn't detect hardly any difference between the intro interfocal or extrafocal patterns. That's the star test. Uh, the collimation is really good. Um, Mars is at opposition right now, and it looks terrific also. So if you're looking at, you know, the moon, double stars, planets, and smaller deep sky objects, this is really, really going to be great for you. 
The only thing it won't do is those low power sweeping views if that's the kind of thing that you like to do. One other caution about the size and the weight. When I set this thing up, I don't know about you, but I'm mentally calculating the amount of time and effort it's going to take me to break it back down and bring it back into the garage. And I'm subtracting that from the amount of time that I'm spending outdoors. So if I'm budgeting, say, two hours to do this, yeah, you know, I may only stay out there for an hour and 45 minutes or so because I need that 15 minutes to break this thing down. Now, for balance about the size and the weight, I want to point out two things. Number one, in meeting those of you out there, I am surprised how many of you bought one of these as your first and your only telescope. This is probably not the first model I would recommend for a first timer. It's a little bit too big. The focal length is a little bit too long. But some of you do this and you make this work. So I guess that could be okay. The second thing I want to point out is the owner of this telescope is a club member and he is at least partially disabled and he has no problem assembling this thing. I have watched him do this from a scooter and he's got it down to the point where he knows exactly how much weight he can put on different parts of his body and he says it doesn't bother him to set this thing up. So something else for you to consider. Well, alrighty. Now that we've demonstrated the telescope, it's time to take this thing down. So go ahead and loosen this axis, point it down. You notice the uh, users put a really beautiful moonlight focus around here. That's great, but it adds even more weight. I'm going to go ahead and undo these three screws down here. And normally, <coughs> taking this thing down is not as much of a problem as setting it up. So I didn't bother to put the keypad or the uh, telrad on here. But other than that, we can take the lid of the JMI case, put it on here, close the lid, and we're good to get this thing outdoors. And let's take a quick walk around on this beast. This one's been outfitted with a telrad, a Vixen plate on the bottom, and a moonlight focuser. Anyway, 11 inch, nice big aperture, F10, 2800 millimeter focal length. You've got the control panel down here, hand controller, PC, auto guider, power switch. This thing is the clutch here so that you can move it back and forth. And again, when you do the initialization, it does not have to be pointed north. A couple of other minor points to address here. First of all, the keypad looks like a lot of other Celestron keypads, but I wouldn't go mixing and matching these. Some of them are meant for Altaz mounts. Some of them are meant for equatorials. I wouldn't go switching these. Second thing is, I have heard reports from some people that this uh, model is somewhat power hungry. I didn't run into this, but on the other hand, I never observed for more than about a couple of hours at a time. I'm just telling you what other people have told me. I use this small lithium power tank and it seemed to be just fine. People who are more serious and want to run all night or consecutive nights in a row will often build their own battery compartments that with a deep cycle marine battery and their own fusing and connectors and this sort of thing. If you do wind up building these, the connector that Celestron uses has a 2.1 millimeter inner diameter and a 5.5 millimeter outer diameter tip positive. I have those values memorized because I have built many of these cables to replace the ones that have broken on me before. And finally, astrophotography. Yes, you can do astrophotography on this, but because it's an alt as scope, um, it's not really suitable as is. You'll notice in the menu that they do have an EQ lineup for EQ North, EQ South, and there is an auto guider port. But if you try to use it in Altaz mode, if you've never done this before, things may seem fine while you're taking the astro photo, but when you see them afterwards, what'll happen is the stuff in the middle will be sharp, but then everything around it will be streaked. So really to do astrophotography with an Altaz scope, you need to put it up on a wedge. And Celestron does sell one of these, 
it's another $350 or so. I'm sorry, I'm spending your money, I know. So there you have it, an overview of the Celestron CPC-1100. As you may be able to tell from my workings with this telescope, it's probably a little bit too big for my tastes. I think if I were to spend my own money today on one of these, I'd probably go for the 925. But don't let me deter you from getting one if this is what you really want. Hope this has been helpful to you. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you soon.